OK, I think we'll get started in just a minute. Uh, looks like the clock just flipped over to 5.50. And I'm in the last session of the day, so I don't want to keep you too long. I know I'm the last thing between everybody and drinks. Um, so if you leave exactly when, you, when you, the drinks start, I won't be offended. Um, I will stick around for any questions after, so I'll probably talk for 35 to 40 minutes, and then I'll just hang out here if anybody wants to chat after. It's a pretty small group here. Um, so thank you for coming. I'm going to be talking about Kudu 1.0 and beyond. Um, so if you didn't read the abstract carefully and just wandered in here, this is more of an intermediate talk. I'm sort of going to expect that you probably have seen something about Kudu before. Um, you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to have used it. But I'm not going to spend too much time on reviewing. Um, I'll spend a couple of minutes on reviewing what Kudu is and then dive more into some of the new features and the roadmap that we've got for the, the next six months to a year. Um, so if you, you know, thought you were in a different talk, feel free to leave. I won't be offended. So the quick overview review, I won't spend more than you know, three or four minutes here, what Kudu is. Uh, so you might have seen this graph before if you've ever seen a Kudu talk. This is my jokingly called a MBA graph because there's no numbers. It's just words on axes, and you kind of like plop things into quadrants and call it a day. Uh, so this is the most analyst-like slide I'm going to give. Uh, where basically you can say that HDFS is kind of your traditional H uh, Hadoop storage system. Um, and you can sort of put blob stores like S3 in that quadrant as well. It's very good at append-only kind of bulk load use cases where you dump a bunch of data in, and then you want to scan all that data back and do some aggregate analysis, run some SQL queries, run some machine learning model building, um, you know, kind of big data movement type operations. Uh, but if you look at the, the farther edge of the two axes, it's not so good at real time, random access, uh, streaming data ingest, uh, anything like that. HDFS is much more of this kind of block-oriented, blob-oriented storage. HBase, on the other hand, is very good at random access. You can do single row updates, inserts, et cetera. Uh, you know, a couple of milliseconds at a time, it gives you this NoSQL style API. But if you try to run like a SQL query or a Spark job on top of HBase, you'll usually be disappointed by the performance. So what we've seen over the past years before Kudu came along is people built complex hybrid architectures, sometimes called a Lambda architecture, that kind of tries to bridge this gap between the two, where you're putting some data in HDFS and then some data in, in HBase and defining some kind of union or data migration, and it becomes very complicated very fast. So the goal with Kudu is to fill that gap. We're not trying to be a better HDFS. Um, I still have you know, many coworkers working on HDFS. Uh, we still have an HBase team working on HBase. Those are great for their particular use cases. But Kudu is trying to be this kind of middle ground that's pretty good for everything, and that makes your application architecture much simpler because we can do both analytic data operations like HDFS can, and we can do low latency single row operations more like HBase. Uh, so the elevator pitch is kind of scalable, fast, tabular storage. So scalable meaning we've tested you know, multi-hundred node clusters. Comcast gave a talk recently about a cluster they've got. It's, I think, around 350 or 400 nodes at this point. And the design is meant to scale to the same kind of sizes as the other Hadoop ecosystem components. So we're talking thousands of nodes. We haven't tested 1,000-plus nodes yet, um, but the design should, should scale. In terms of speed, of course, we expect uh, the speed to be pretty much linear with the number of nodes or the resources in the cluster. So each node should kind of give what you expect, multiple gigabytes a second of read throughput, given today's storage, uh, and millions of random operations per second. Um, and then you can scale that by the number of nodes in the cluster. And the data model is tabular. So you can imagine a relational table with a schema and types and columns uh, and rows and primary keys, and we store those. We're not a file system. We're not trying to compete with file systems. We just store tables. Uh, so you can have any number of rows in the table, you know, hundreds of billions is completely reasonable. But it is a strict schema table. So the APIs that we have, uh, the NoSQL API looks very much like other NoSQL APIs you might have seen. We've got Java, C++, Python. Uh, a couple of community members have written things like Rust and Go, uh, but they're not really first class yet. If you want to read from the NoSQL API, you can do that too. Uh, you can create these scanner objects. You can you know, get the data from a single client. These are very low latency operations. You're going directly to the correct servers and getting responses on the order of milliseconds using index lookups uh, to update, insert, or read. Uh, we also offer some basic predicates through the API. If you want to say, give me all the stuff in the last minute, you could create a predicate on the timestamp column, uh, you know, use current time millis, do these kind of simple operations. But it's worth noting the API doesn't give you anything complicated. Kudu is not a SQL database. 
You can't say do a group by aggregate. You can't do a join. You can't do anything like that. Uh, the API is really this elemental, low-level access to storage. Of course, that's not what people usually want to use for their analytics. Uh, so we get these higher-level operations like group buys and joins and machine learning, et cetera, uh, by, by integrating with these other components like Spark or Impala. Uh, so if you want SQL, you can use Impala. You can type arbitrary SQL commands. Everything that Impala can do on Parquet or HDFS, you can do against Kudu. Um, same goes for Spark. If you want to run mllib and do k-means clustering on your Kudu table, that's great. You can get it directly as a data frame. It will be very, very efficient at doing that. Um, so most of this talk is going to be about Kudu internal, not about how you'd access Kudu via Impala or Spark. Uh, if you want to hear more about Impala integration in particular, I've got a talk tomorrow at 2.20, I think, uh, where we'll talk more about kind of the higher level usage of Kudu and less about Kudu internals. Uh, so today is more on the internal side. So that's the kind of five minute, uh, let's see if I did five minute. Yeah, five minute uh, overview of Kudu. And now kind of the meat of the talk. Um, hopefully nobody is thoroughly confused at this point. Uh, we're going to be talking about what we've been up to basically over the last year. So June 2016, uh, we had just released Kudu 0.9. Uh, it wasn't 1.0 yet. It was still considered beta. Um, now, actually today, we just finished the release for Kudu 1.4. We'll announce it tomorrow. Um, so what have we done in the last year or so? But before we even talk about that, I wanted to sort of set the stage of what was the beta meant to do. So the first release of Kudu that was public was 0.5, which was at the Strata conference at the end of 2015 in New York. And the goal of that was not to come out and build a new product that we'd immediately launch and have the world use. The goal was basically to show that this kind of thing was possible. People had sort of assumed that we were stuck in this world where you have HDFS on one side and HBase on the other, and there's no possible way to build some system that has the best characteristics of both. So the goal was basically show that this is something that could be built, um, something that could be used for real workloads, but not really production ready. And we also wanted to start building an open source community. Um, you know, if you go around this conference, most of these core infrastructure components are going to be open source, and Kudu is as well. And we felt like we needed to get out early to start getting feedback from early adopters, get real usage in the field. Uh, and we did actually have some early adopters already running uh, limited production applications at that time, um, but it really wasn't ready for most enterprises. So during that first year, and really through our 1.0 release, uh, the goal was basically to do these three things. The first, of course, is eliminate blocker bugs, um, do stability, correctness, make sure everything just is really, really solid. As a storage system, if we have great features, but we sometimes crash and lose your data, you're not going to touch it. We'd rather have like two features that work really well than have 10 that uh, you know, kind of fall apart when you try to really use them. Um, the second, as I mentioned, we wanted to get early feedback from these early tech adopters. So we had some companies like Xiaomi in China, who's a, a really um, cutting edge technology company there, a couple in the US as well, who are just taking this early software, maybe building it themselves, deploying it, um, giving us feedback from their use cases. And the third is building a long-term community. Uh, so we moved to the Apache Foundation. Uh, we really wanted to have contributors from all around the world, et cetera. Um, I always sort of tell the team this one thing in the blue box here at the bottom. I'd rather have 100, or sorry, 10 happy users than 100 unhappy ones. So if you add a feature, you can think about that as getting more users. If you just add stability, you're not really increasing what you can do, but you're going to make your existing users happy. So we always try to make sure everything we do is really high quality, really well tested, uh, before we think about doing anything new. So just a couple of stats over the last uh, year or two that we've got from OpenHub, which is kind of an open source tracking site. Uh, lines of code is kind of a silly metric, but you can see we're continuing to add more, more stuff, more tests, uh, more features as we go. And maybe the more exciting one is contributors per month. Um, so you can see back in 2013, that line I think is either one or two. I think it's myself and somebody else. Uh, and now we're averaging between 10 and 15 uh, unique contributors per month. And if you look around like a six month kind of uh, time frame or 12 month, we have you know, between 30 and 50 different contributors. So in the last 12 months, 48 active contributors. So the community really is growing. Uh, we're getting contributions from all over different users, uh, a couple of hobbyists who are just kind of getting interested in throwing up a patch. Uh, so if anybody here wants to contribute, it's very easy. There are a lot of people doing it. Uh, so less about community and more about specific new features that people want to see, you know, what can we do now that we couldn't do before. And particularly, I'm going to talk about since 0.9, which is, you know, this conference time last year. Uh, what have we done? 
So one key feature that I think is really, really unique to Kudu um, and really, really powerful is our dynamic partition management. Um, so if you're coming from a relational database background, this won't seem very exciting to you. Uh, but if you're coming from kind of other Hadoop components, uh, this is actually pretty compelling. So one of the big areas people are using Kudu is in time series data or data warehousing data that has some kind of a time component. So you can imagine sensor data coming from machines, IoT kind of use cases, or you can imagine maybe a transactions table or a web log table in your data warehouse where there's a timestamp and it's basically moving forward with time as you collect data. And you want to be able to use range partitioning on that. So you can do things like immediately get to the right part of data. If I'm querying for just today, I don't want to scan all of history. So we have the ability to range partition. And that's the same thing that you get in, say, um, HBase. But if you just range partition, you have this problem called hot spotting, where all of your new data is hitting this one partition, and it's hitting one machine in your cluster, and that one machine can't keep up with your data rates, especially if you have like a, a high frequency of collection IoT application. Um, so we can combine this with uh, hash partitioning. So we actually have the ability to have range partitioned and hash partitioned at the same time. So you can spread the work across many machines and also have these range partitions. And then you can dynamically add and drop these range partitions uh, sort of as time changes. So if you have an application where you only need to keep one year of data, you can create a range partition for each day. And then every day you drop the partition from 365 days ago. And that's an incredibly efficient metadata operation. And you know, it happens in a second or two. Uh, so this is a very, very powerful thing for time series use cases um, that you don't see in some of the other NoSQL type uh, applications out there. Um, so there's some interesting semantics here, uh, kind of limitations on it, which are both good and bad, I guess, depending on your perspective. When you create a range partition, that sort of says this is an area of key space that is valid. And if you have an area that's not covered by any range partition, say you're trying to insert data from um, the year 2040, Kudu is going to give you an error saying that partition doesn't exist. So this is good from a data cleanliness perspective. Um, maybe the downside is you have to manually create new partitions as time moves forward. Uh, but we sort of have this idea that structure is a good idea on these kind of applications. We don't want to just willy-nilly create random partitions as people insert bad data, for example. Uh, another area that we spent a lot of work on over the last year is the Python client. Um, so this is originally was kind of an experimental thing we, we threw out there to see if people liked it. Uh, a guy named Jordan Birdzell, who was previously at State Farm, um, picked this up and kind of ran with it. Uh, so thanks to him, he made this very production ready, has parity with the C++ client, and you can do pretty much all the operations I'll talk about from Python. Uh, it's especially popular with data science kind of people who want to run PySpark or just any little simple app from Python. Uh, performance is a big area that we've worked on over the last couple of years. I mean, performance is always a critical thing for data systems. Um, the more data you have, the more you care about saving cycles. And we've made a ton of improvements. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I'll pick out a couple. Um, so one is the bulk write throughput, which was a focus specifically in the release that just came out today. Um, originally, when we had Kudu release, we said, this is for streaming applications. You're going to stream in data. Essentially, compared to the total volume of data you have, the amount that you're going to ingest any second is going to be tiny. So maybe you're talking about streaming 10 megabytes, 20 megabytes a second. Let's not worry too much about the write throughput. Uh, but then we found people really want to use this for data warehouse applications, not just streaming ingest. And in a data warehouse, you might actually have a data load come once per night. Uh, so it's not a new school kind of streaming thing. It's more the old, old school. You get a data dump at 6 AM, and that data dump has to be ready by 7 AM when your analysts arrive and want to start querying it. So bulk writes actually turned out to be important. And we, we spent a lot of time on that recently, and about two and a half times improvement on our, our some benchmarks that we've ran, um, including importing TPCH data sets. Uh, so this is pretty pretty big improvement, um, and even more than that when you compare back to the original beta releases. Uh, another one I want to highlight is the uh, MTTR and restart time. So if you have a large cluster, maybe you've got you know, 40 nodes, something like that, and one of your nodes crashes, it's really important to know when am I going to be back up to the full durability. So if I've got three replicas, uh, one node crashes. Now there's only two replicas of a lot of your data. The time it takes to get back to three is a pretty important metric because if you have you know, more simultaneous crashes during that same period of uh, degraded state, you could end up with data being unavailable. Uh, so that's about 10 times better in the latest version. This was actually reported to us uh, by a guy who works at Kakao, which is a large internet company in Korea. 
Uh, so we're seeing really good improvements in all these important metrics for stability and production use. Uh, another one I'll highlight is the memory management. So if anybody here has tried an early version of Kudu, especially tried writing a lot of data fast into it, you might have seen these errors pop out saying you know, memory throttled, you're getting timeouts uh, due to memory pressure, some of these other kind of warnings pop out. And we spent a lot of work on that to make it much more consistent in performance, not give these kind of errors, uh, just reduce the overall consumption of the server. Um, so now we can actually get a lot more data into one node and not spend as much memory indexing it and uh, keeping track of metadata. Uh, this is just one graph that I wanted to highlight comparing the Kudu 0.5, which was our first public release, to Kudu 1.1. Um, it's actually gotten even better since then. I didn't have time to rerun the benchmarks. But you can see there's pretty substantial improvements, like 17x on one of these workloads. Uh, the others are less exciting, you know, 2.4, 3x. Um, but they're still pretty good numbers. If I say something is three times faster than it used to be, that's a pretty big improvement. Uh, and now probably one of the most exciting features for enterprises is security. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the security model we used to have and the security model we now have today as of Kudu 1.3, which was released a couple months back. So the original Kudu authentication is what we call the American Dream security model. Um, the American Dream is being able to follow your own personal calling. You can do whatever you want to do. You can be whoever you want to be. And we took that to heart. Uh, Michael Phelps also has a good quote. With practice, you can be whatever you want to be. The goal, you can be, you know, do whatever direction you want to take. Uh, that's not a great security model for a database. If I just come into Kudu and say, hey, I want to be the administrator. I'm going to delete everything. Kudu said, yep, that's great. Go for it. As long as you want to be it, you can do it. Uh, so we got rid of that model. Now we have a new model, which is kind of the standard authorization model, uh, similar to the rest of the Hadoop components. So that means Kerberos. Uh, Kerberos is a single sign-on system, often implemented by Active Directory, uh, could be implemented using MIT Curb5, uh, but it's the same system that HDFS and Spark and the rest of the ecosystem uses. Uh, so with Kudu 1.3, you can K in it with Kerberos, and then you can give all of your daemons a key tab, and they're all Kerberized. Uh, so that allows the clients to authenticate themselves to the servers, uh, it allows the clients to verify that the server they're talking to is actually the one they want to, so you're not getting a man in the middle trying to steal your traffic. Uh, and it also authenticates servers to each other, so you can't have somebody try to join your cluster, pretend to be a, a tablet server, and you know, maybe get extra replicas of your data. Uh, so it's basically all parties will authenticate to each other via Kerberos. Uh, so that's the authentication part. Then authorization is that we will, you know, disallow access from anybody who's not authenticated, for one. It's kind of the, the most basic level of authorization. Um, and also, the, another point here about authentication is that it works with all your compute frameworks. Uh, so there's this kind of subtlety about using Kerberos with compute frameworks, where when you submit a job to, say, Spark, your initial task that you submit the job from has Kerberos credentials. You know, you logged in, you k-edited, you create this job with Kerberos credentials. Now, Spark goes and creates all these tasks running on the cluster, and they don't actually have your credential. They're just being run by Spark. Um, so we have to do this little dance we call delegation tokens. Um, we actually call them authentication tokens inside of Kudu. We're basically, when we create the job, we create this token that lives with the job, and that token represents your credentials. So it delegates your own credentials to your tasks, who can then act as you. So this all seems relatively complicated, but the upshot is it's actually very simple. If you want to run a job on a secure, a secure Kudu cluster, it looks just like running on an insecure one. Uh, you submit the job to Spark, and it just works. Another area of security that's pretty important, and we actually released at the same time as authentication, is the TLS wire encryption. Uh, so TLS is the same thing as SSL, if you're more familiar with that terminology. Uh, and one of the choices we actually made, which is different than most of the other components in this space, is we decided, hey, this is something that should be important for everybody. You know, we were designing this at the same time a lot of information was coming out about, you know, uh, government wiretapping and everything like that. So we said, let's just make everything encrypted by default. So when you upgrade to Kudu 1.3, if you have a 1.3 server and 1.3 client, they will speak TLS to each other with no configuration required. We think that's a, a pretty big benefit uh, for a system storing critical data. Uh, so this means both servers talking to each other for replication traffic and clients talking to servers. So if you authenticate the system as well, if you enable Kerberos and give everybody the Kerberos credentials, um, this is actually based on essentially bootstrapping the PKI system off of the Kerberos system. Uh, so we use Kerberos to authenticate the, the servers to each other, 
and then they generate on the fly SSL certificates, um, sign each other based on those Kerberos identities, and then everything is kind of tied together to ensure that uh, it's both encrypted and, author or sorry, and authenticated via TLS certificate. Um, if we don't have the Kerberos system there to actually authenticate the, the parties to each other, you can't do that. Um, the best we can do is kind of make these self-signed certificates and talk to each other with self-signatures. So if you don't have any identity system like Kerberos, uh, there's still a possibility of a man in the middle um, trying to you know, take over a port and um, you know, get your data. But any kind of passive network sniffer who just plugs into your network and captures packets, they can't read what you're sending. Uh, so it still gives you a pretty good level of protection with zero configuration. So one of the big concerns people have when I say TLS by default, everything is encrypted, is isn't this gonna kill my performance? Uh, and the answer is no, for two reasons. The first is that we use all of the AES native instructions in Intel chips. Um, so all of the optimizations that they've done make encryption very, very low overhead these days. Um, so with TLS on, maybe 10% overhead max. But the bigger thing is actually that we've added TLS pass-through for local connections. So if you think about a task like a Spark task or an Impala query fragment, most of the time these tasks will be scheduled so they're local on the same nodes as the actual data. So they're running on the same host. And we'll detect this fact and say, hey, I've got two processes that are communicating within a loopback interface. We don't actually need to worry about wire encryption because there's no wire here. They're just you know, going between memory on the same host. If there's root on that host trying to sniff, well, if they're root, they already could have gotten all the data anyway. So we don't need to protect against that. Uh, so we'll detect this case, use TLS for the negotiation and authentication portion, make sure that it's an authenticated connection, not man in the middle, uh, but then we'll drop the encryption. So we'll kind of do a, a zero encryption cipher for TLS, uh, which means that in most of our actual workloads, like you know, TPC, HTPC, DS, uh, on Impala, we don't see any overhead at all based on this wire encryption, uh, which is a pretty nice property. So that kind of covers the authentication and encryption. Um, the last kind of pillar in security is probably authorization. And we started in Fudu 1.3 with a very, very, very simple authorization scheme. So there's only three layers of authorization. You can either be a client, an admin, or a service. Really, the third one, service, is more of an internal idea. This is how the demons uh, will authorize each other. So as a user, you're either a client or an admin. Um, there's no different levels, there's no role-based authorization, which is very, very simple. If you're a client, you can do everything with the data. You can read and write data, you can create tables, you can drop tables. Uh, if you're an admin, there's a little bit of extra administrative functionality you can do, like changing configuration of the cluster. Uh, but basically, everybody has pretty full access. Uh, and this is all configured by a user whitelist, meaning you can say, hey, I've authenticated all of my users in my company via Kerberos, but I actually only want you know, John, Joe, and Beth to be the people who can actually access Kudu. Um, so obviously, this isn't a very flexible authorization model. It's totally limited compared to what you'd actually need in many use cases. Uh, but we found that in a lot of other use cases, you can actually define a pretty well-defined set of users who will need to access Kudu. Uh, and it's worth noting this is not our end game. This is obviously a step along the way. Uh, in the end, we will have a much, uh, much more flexible authorization scheme, which we'll talk about later. So just to give you a quick overview of how you configure this, um, you basically need to set these five flags. You need to say, I want to require authentication. I want to require encryption. I'm going to set these two users to be able to be clients. Um, so Impala, anything going through Impala can access the data, and then Impala can enforce its own permissions. Uh, and maybe Joe's ETL task has a user associated with it, kind of a service account. Um, and then maybe Susan's the admin, so we'll give her that ACL, and then we'll give it a key tab. This is all you need to do to set up security. There's nothing else. Everything is all encrypted and secure after that. And then you can use normal commands like grant and revoke within Impala to get more fine-grained access, saying that these users can access these tables but not these other tables. Uh, so this is sufficient for a large number of applications. So that kind of gives the overview of the security feature. I want to talk a little bit about some real-world experiences and operations that we've had um, over the last year or two. So is Kudu bug-free? I mentioned earlier we spend a lot of time making sure there's no bugs working on quality. Um, of course it's not bug-free. Everybody has bugs. It's software. Uh, but we're very resilient to bugs. So there's this funny quote that I got from one of the engineers at uh, JD.com. It's a huge e-commerce site in China. 
Um, they've actually been in the news because their stock has been going crazy good recently. Uh, so on June 18th last year, so about a year ago, they had a huge sale where they did a majority of their transactions for the year, I think, end up on this one day. It's this crazy popular day. And they had this 250 node Kudu cluster capturing all this transactional data. So it gets some stats saying, you know, we've done billions of transactions during this day, uh, millions of rows per second being inserted into Kudu. Um, and once an hour, there was a big sale and a big flood of traffic and a daemon would crash. And he said, but thanks to Raft, thanks to the way we do replication, even though these demons kept crashing once an hour, uh, the system stayed up, everything worked, everything worked well, they got their business case done. Um, so it was kind of a you know, good and bad in, in the same thing. Turned out there was one bug that had been committed a couple days before. He was running his own trunk build, um, hit that bug, we fixed it two days later. Um, so it wasn't like it's some big flaw, um, but the main thing is we're very, very resilient to bugs. Our design is meant to be resilient. If there's any bug that affects one replica, it won't spread to other replicas. Uh, so in the wild, we've actually never seen data loss yet. Um, we've seen a couple cases of data loss in test clusters, you know, due to a bug on trunk that gets resolved a couple days later. Uh, we've seen occasional cases of a single replica being corrupted, and we have some tools we can use to fix that pretty easily, to repair from the other good replicas. Um, other kind of issues like downtime, very, very rare. Partial availability has been a little bit more common. So partial availability means maybe things are up and available for reads but not for writes or things are up but kind of slow so you're not hitting your SLAs. Um, you know, various issues have contributed to this but we've been kind of fixing them release by release. Every release is more stable than the prior one. Um, all the cases we've seen with crashes are actual downtime, we have root cause analysis. We don't have any known bugs that are causing crashes in the wild. Uh, so one tool we have that's really useful for these kind of issues, I mentioned there's some cases when one replica has some bug and you know, goes out of sync. We have this tool called KSTK. You can't quite read it here, I apologize on the projector. Uh, basically you run it and it says, hey, there's three replicas. One of these replicas has been marked as corrupt. We detected some problem. And you say, well, I've run this tool and it tells me that. What do you do? So we run this tool called remote replica delete. Um, so you delete the bad replica. And then Kudu will kind of notice this and say, oh, whoops, I'm supposed to have three. I only have two. I better make a new copy. So it immediately just starts making a new copy. And uh, if you run it again, you'll see there's a tablet copy. It's in this copying state. And within a minute or two, it will have healed itself. Um, so it's a very, very uh, easy tool. If anything goes wrong on one replica, delete it. It'll fix itself. Um, we can fix you know, the vast majority of issues with this tool. Uh, so in the last kind of section here, I want to talk a bit about our roadmap. But first, a warning that this is an open source project. Uh, we don't really publish a roadmap because the roadmap is whatever the contributors bring. So if people in this room want to bring a new feature, that's now our roadmap. Um, but I can speak to what my personal team that I work on is going to be working on, um, you know, with the, the caveat that obviously this isn't commitments, this is what we hope to be doing, and it depends on contributors coming in and helping with it. So on the security side, obviously the authorization story we talked about where we just said these users can access Kudu, these users can't is not sufficient, we want more fine-grained. And the way we plan to do that is kind of two stages. The first is metadata integration with the Hive Metastore. So when you create a table, it will kind of be resident in a Hive database. And then all of the rules that you can then apply later to that database via things like Sentry um, can kind of take effect in a more consistent manner. You can define these policies in the same place that uh, span Kudu tables and HDFS tables. You don't need to think about them as two different storage systems. So in the end, this will give us table level, column level authorization, uh, RBAC. In the future, things like attribute-based access control will come in Sentry as well. Um, so we're kind of positioning ourselves to take advantage of all of the advances coming in the, the overall Hadoop ecosystem. Operability continues to be a big focus, as I said at the beginning. As a storage system, it's very, very important to have these kind of things like stability and recovery tools. Um, so we're continuing to work on resilience to partial failure. So for example, if a single disk fails, Right now, that'll cause the entire server worth of disks to, to go offline. We're making it so we can stay online with a single disk having failed and just lose a portion of our capacity instead of the entire capacity on that machine. Um, some new tools around load balancing and data balancing. As a cluster is kind of old, it may go out of balance as nodes have been taken out and bring, brought back online, et cetera. Um, so we're adding a balancer. Um, and then some more problem diagnosis type things. So some tools to say, well, my cluster is online and it's working, but it's a little slower than I usually would expect it. Um, here's a tool that will auto-diagnose some, looking at the metrics, what might be going wrong, give you some hints, 
how you might be able to change your application or your configuration to improve it. Uh, performance and scale are kind of the bread and butter of these distributed systems. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go through all these details. I think we're running a little short on time. Um, but we are working on kind of increasing our scale limits, increasing how much data per node we can store, et cetera. Um, so we've got clusters like Comcast, we talked recently about running on about 400, 420 nodes, something like that cluster. There's others in that scale. Um, but we're really kind of recommending sub-100 nodes at this point for most people. And we want to kind of push that limit up closer to 1,000 over the next year. So to wrap up, I want to talk about joining the community. As I said, this is a community project. Uh, lots of people involved right now. We can add your logo here as well. If you're a user and you want to be on this slide, come talk to me. I'll paste it in. So check out our website, kudu.apache.org. Um, got all the normal open source uh, stuff there, you know, mailing lists, um, Jira trackers, et cetera. Uh, and there's a quick start VM you can get from Cloudera if you want to try it out. Um, obviously, Cloudera is going to be easiest. I work at Cloudera, so we've made that very easy, but you can also install just by building from source if you prefer to do that. And as a developer, of course, open source, you can see all our code reviews. Um, join our Slack if you want to to chat with the developers, talk about your use case, et cetera. Um, so that about wraps up. I think we don't have much time for questions. Um, oh, I guess we have a bit for questions, maybe five minutes or so, and I'll also stick around here. Yeah? Uh, so the question, just in case people couldn't hear in the back, is Raft um, relies on a majority of replicas being online. So you may have three replicas defined, and then let's say something goes wrong and two nodes failed. Uh, you know, the algorithm of Raft says if you have a minority, you can't continue. Um, so what happens is basically that will be not available for writes. Um, you'll only have one remaining replica. And we actually have a tool uh, called uh, unsafe config change, where you can point it at the tablet and say, I want to choose as an operator to do something that's not safe based on the algorithm of Raft. And I want to promote this minority replica to the majority. Um, so you're accepting that it's possible you might have lost some edits that were only on those two nodes, um, but you're kind of making the choice for availability over correctness. Uh, so we do have this tool you can run as an admin, um, but it's not going to automatically recover from that because the, there's no way to guarantee we didn't lose an edit that was only on those other two nodes. Uh, so reads, it depends on the mode of the read. If you need a consistent read, it can't read from that node because it doesn't know whether that node is partitioned or if it's actually the only one left. Um, but there's a read mode which is basically you read whatever you got. So if you don't need consistency on your reads, it will read from a minority, um, uh, you know, the last remaining replica, even if it's not up to date. Uh, so you can always kind of make these choices based on your application. Uh, so the question is basically comparing uh, Druid and Kudu. Um, so there's actually on Druid's GitHub, there's a little page that says you know, Druid versus X for many different X. Uh, there's one on there versus Kudu that I participated in kind of helping them write. Uh, so I think that should be a reasonably balanced resource if you want to check that out. Um, but to quickly summarize my thoughts on it here, uh, Druid is basically a combined system where it's both storage and query for the most part. Um, and because of that, they don't have the same richness of SQL support that you get from something like uh, Impala or that you get from Spark SQL. Um, they've taken these two things, and it's very, very good at the kind of applications it's designed for, which is uh, you know, a big scan over a huge fact table um, with some pre-aggregated data, uh, some approximate count distincts, things like that. Um, but as soon as you want to say, I want to do a data warehouse style join of 17 different tables in a snowflake schema, and then compute a, a, a rolling window, you know, a lag function from the SQL 92 standard, Druid's like, no, nah, I don't know how to do that, right? Um, so basically I'm saying that if you want something that's a very specific one big table analysis on a fact table, Druid's probably gonna beat out Kudu, it has some nice features. Uh, but if you want something that looks more like a general data warehouse, um, Kudu plus Impala or Kudu plus Spark is gonna be a lot more flexible. Uh, another big aspect that we have is that we can update arbitrary data uh, and random access individual rows. And Drury doesn't have indexing and updates for things like that. Uh, so again, it's good if you have streaming ingest only, big aggregates, 
um, but it's much less flexible. It doesn't have updatability. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, can you explain how the raft yeah. Uh, so raft is actually happening on a per tablet level. Um, so typically, when you create a very large table, let's imagine they just have one table, um, and let's say they have 300 nodes. So they probably would create a table that has around 10 tablets per node. So that would be 3,000 tablets. So that means there's 3,000 raft groups. Uh, so it's not like you're taking the, the cluster and split it into you know groups of three, which replicate to each other every individual node is probably replicating to 10 other nodes or 20 other nodes uh, that are parts of different raft groups. So this means if one node goes down, you get parallel reconstruction across the remainder of the cluster. Everybody starts copying to everybody to repair, rather than you know, just two nodes copying to a third, something like that. So then when you have two heartbeats, you have So currently we have a lot of heartbeats. Um, you're, I think, uh, comparing to something that CockroachDB did called multi-raft, where they try to do aggregation of heartbeats across multiple raft groups that happen to have landed on the same nodes. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons why we haven't done it yet. One is they're trying to do very, very small tablets on the order of like 32 megabytes. Ours are typically on the order of 10 gigabytes. So we don't try to support you know, 100,000 tablets per node, something like that, that they, they are trying to support. Um, the other is they're trying to run WAN, typically. Most of our deployments are single data center. Uh, so the cost of these heartbeats is not so large. So we are chatty, but you know, on a you know, 20 gigabyte or sorry, 20 gigabit or 10 gigabit network in a local data center, these small heartbeat packets going every half second is like, oh, whatever, 100 extra packets per second. Who's going to complain? Um, so we haven't seen that really be a bottleneck yet. Um, we have talked about doing something more like multi-raft. It gets a little bit complicated. Um, I think if you look at the historical development of CockroachDB, they did it. And then they sort of like backed it out for a while, and then they think they brought it back in a kind of different fashion later, uh, because it turned out to be fairly tricky to do well. So, can you comment a little, a little bit more uh, on, on the high-level solution you mm -hmm. um, If you're in Pala integration, can you get that uh, ready for the players? Yeah, uh, so the question is to ask a bit about the plans for Hive Metastore integration and contrast with what we already have with Impala. Uh, so today, if you want to query a Kudu table via Impala, what you have to do is create the Kudu table, um, and then Impala doesn't know about it yet. You have to go into Impala and say, create external table blah, store it as Kudu, and the Kudu table name is XYZ. Uh, so it's not like they're tightly integrated. It's more like you've created this mapping table object in the Hive Metastore that points to an externally managed Kudu table. Um, and then if you were to use, say, the Kudu API to rename the Kudu table, and try to query it from Impala. Impala would get very confused because it doesn't have the same name and the HMS metadata is pointing to it by name. Um, so there's a lot of these things like this that make it a little bit confusing. And then this gets particularly bad with security policies um, because you want to describe a security policy like grant select on this database, meaning this whole collection of tables, grant select on this database to this particular role. Uh, what does it mean for a Kudu table to be in a particular database is not clear. Uh, because it may actually have been mapped into many different databases. So then if you come at the Kudu table via the API, how are we going to consistently enforce that policy because we don't even know which Hive database it was part of? Uh, so there's a lot of these kind of complexities about we want to make the mapping a lot tighter. So if you were to create a table in Kudu, it would just automatically be in HMS. It would be in exactly one HMS database and uh, kind of fall under the, um, the like a single policy just like any other HMS database would. Uh, so this is a little bit up in the air. I think there'll be some design docs circulated about this in the next couple of weeks. Um, mostly throwing around these ideas on the team right now. We haven't published anything about it. Any other questions? Cool. I guess people. Oh, one more. Yeah. Um, the question is our recommendations on cluster scale. I said not more than 100. So essentially for our recommendations, we kind of have two sets of recommendations that we give. Um, if you look at the Kudu documentation, we have a set of, of you know, here's our best practices, here are things that we don't think you should do. Um, these are basically, we know things will work well if you are at this scale. If you're less than 100, we've tested it well, you know, lots of people do it, it's gonna be fine. It's not like when you add the 101st node, everything's gonna fall apart. 
Um, like I said, Comcast was intrepid, and they said, yeah, let's try 400, and they did. And it's working, and they probably hit some issues that people at 100 don't. Um, so it's more like we want to give best practice recommendations where we as a team feel confident you won't hit problems. Um, and some of them are kind of arbitrary. You know, people might ask, why not 120? It's like, there's no reason why not 120. We made it up. We picked 100 out of thin air. Uh, but it's just to give people an idea of what they should, when they should expect things to work and when they might expect problems. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question or not, but there's no real limits on, on the scale dimension there. It's just that we have done very little testing of larger clusters, and you're probably going to be the first person to hit a new bug that no one's seen before. Um, so if you've got the appetite for that, by all means, go for it. Um, but you should probably expect to you know, maybe build your own version, be able to take a, a patch, you know, expect you might have problems when you try to do it the first time. Um, so questions about blobs and largest binary strings you can put in a particular cell. Uh, we've limited to 64K right now. Um, that actually is a hard limit that's enforced when you write data to Kudu. It'll reject it if you try to write more than 64K. Um, again, it was a little bit arbitrary. Like We put that if statement in there. We picked 64K not for any particularly good reason other than that we haven't tested much bigger. Uh, so if you are uh, adventurous, I'll say, you can run Kudu with a dash unlock experimental options, dash max cell size, whatever size you want, and you're likely to hit a crash if you go to like 10 megs. So we try to you kind of put these guardrails on so that people have a hard time pushing Kudu into the things it wasn't tested with, um, which means that if you, you know, if you don't try to change these experimental options, you're probably staying within a realm we've tested where we feel confident, uh, confident will work. Um, so that's again going back to our philosophy of like happy users. There's plenty of people who are like, I wish I could put a one megabyte object, and we just keep on saying, like, sorry, you can't do it. Um, because we'd rather say you just can't than say, well, it might work, and then they try it, and then they have some weird experience, and um, you know, are disappointed. They felt like it wasn't as advertised. Yeah. The 64K, oh, we're getting waved at. Do we have to wrap up? Okay, uh, so this is the last question. The 64K is the per cell. Uh, so if you have a row with 300 columns, each column may be no more than 64K. It's not the aggregate across the row. Um, does that answer the question? Or, uh, we don't have nested types. So our type is just string or binary or whatever. Um, and that's limited to 64K. So you could put a protobuf in there, but it would be a 64K for your total protobuf. Um, it seems like we're getting kicked out, but I'll, uh, I'll stand around here and chat with people if, if there are more questions. Thank you.